In this video, we are going to build an affordable 4th and 5th axis to machine the crates for the modular production system. During the last years, I've manually packaged and counted thousands of different screws, nuts and washers. All for 3D printed parts that I sell online. So I used 3D printing, PCB design and other processes to build an automatic screw counting machine. The design is based on some fundamental principles and it is parametric, so it should work for a variety of conveyed parts. In this video series, I will go over the components and how I built them. If all goes well, the videos will end with a working modular production system. Since my last video, a lot of things happened with this feeder module over here and it's getting much more into its final form. So now it's time to actually solve a problem that has been bothering me since I had the very first version. And this problem really has to do with these boxes. The boxes themselves are super practical. They are stable, can be stacked, can be combined flexibly and they are also inexpensive. However, in their off-the-shelf state, the boxes obviously don't have the cutouts that we need. And there are really quite a few of them. On different sides of the box, there are various openings for cables, uh, for the magazine, for general attachment points, LEDs, air vents, and so on. For the early prototypes, I simply cut out those openings with a jigsaw. But to be honest, it's not looking super nice. It's not that precise and also it is time consuming. So instead, let's automate it. Okay, so this is my CNC machine. It's essentially a small rotating cutter attached to a three axis motion system. And this enables it to reach any given point on the work area. Now, while I built and designed the few CNC machines over the past years, this design is not from me. It's an open source design called the Volksfräse. And I think for softer materials like woods and plastics, it's quite a good design. If we now want to machine the cutouts into the box, we run into a slight problem. With the cutter just coming in from the top, we could only reach one side at a time. And this means that we would have to uh, stop the machine, then turn the part, relocate it, um, start the process again, and repeat that for all the five sides of the boxes. And this involves manual labor, and I don't want to do this, so instead I came up with this design. To prevent us from having to rotate the box by hand after each side, I have designed two additional axes on which the whole thing can rotate. The basic idea is that first the upper side is machined, then the whole thing tilts up and the next side is machined, and so on. This assembly should ensure a high certainty of location and allow us to clamp the box once and then just press the start button and let the CNC do its job. Conventional add-ons like this can easily cost tens of thousands of euros, so we need to cut costs somewhere. The single biggest advantage in this case is that we are just machining plastics. Here the cutting forces are not that high, allowing us to use 3D printed components for some of the parts. The large fourth axis is driven by two geared stepper motors via these curved herringbone racks. Normally you would use a gearbox that has a continuous tooth engagement, like an harmonic or cycloidal drive, but they are way too expensive. Instead, we can use planetary gears with low backlash. The third area where we need to cut costs are the bearings. More on that later. The box itself is held onto the work holding plate using two 3D printed clamps. By tightening the bolt, this part rotates and clamps the box. Now before we start to build it, we come to an important part of the video. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Many of you probably know Skillshare for their classes in photography, film and video editing and illustration. But Skillshare actually has classes in a lot of other topics as well. For example, there are also classes in productivity and time management where really experienced people share their knowledge. Now, I personally want to make better videos and be more productive. For example, I just completed a class about 
shooting and editing videos that I really enjoyed. This gave me some different perspectives and a lot of inspiration in a topic that I'm constantly trying to get better at. So now I want to use this to further improve my video quality. I personally always learned the most from people that were very good at something and that explained that topic to me. To kind of get a feeling for how they do what they do. And this is exactly the point where Skillshare starts, which is a very interesting concept. So I think it's great that there is an opportunity for you to explore their courses for free. The first 1000 people to use the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. First, we print all the necessary components. And this build involves a lot of 3D printing. The entire assembly process was quite long, so I will focus on a few most important aspects here only. This is a grooved ball bearing, the most popular and cheapest type of bearings. This one costs only about 4 euros, so I want to use that. The problem is that when we mount such a bearing together with the turntable on its position, it has a lot of play. This type of bearing in general does not like the eccentric load and it would not survive long. But the typical bearing for this kind of load can easily cost a few hundred euros. So I came up with this hybrid. Because of the shape of the orange gears, the turntable can't wobble. So it combines the radial accuracy of the standard bearing with the planarity provided by the orange gears. Since we shifted axial and eccentric load from the main bearing, the orange bearings might be a bit unhappy, but based on some rough calculations, I think we should be fine here. And instead of a few hundred euros, it costs eight. So it's at least worth a try. As pointed out by some of you in the comment section of my last video, gear lubrication is an important aspect of any gear train. But I don't like getting grease all over my lap when I have to assemble and disassemble a prototype a hundred times. So this is actually a bit silly but a really cool trick that I have used for printed gears in the past. This is regular lip protection stuff and I love it for prototype lubrication. The stuff definitely dries out after a while but I have the feeling that it kind of soaks into the printed parts just like it would do with your skin. I have some gearboxes that I greased with this stuff years ago and they still run silent. And unlike some industrial grease, it's healthy and easy to clean. So for a prototype that you would otherwise not grease at all, I think it's a pretty good alternative. Next, an inductive limit switch for homing the axis is attached. Now all there is left to do is to assemble the fixture for the box onto the upper plate and mount this plate to the turntable. Okay, so now that we have something that could actually work, let's test it.
And now we finally got it, a box with a lot of holes. I have to say, I just love how well bearing bone gear seems to work. I mean, after all, it's still using three printed components in the load path of a CNC machine. And this is usually not a good idea. However, in this case, it seems to work surprisingly well. Things like stiffness don't really come across on video, but it's really quite cool. Of course, time will tell, but so far it's promising. Having the CNC now running with 3 plus 2 axes unlocks a lot of super cool possibilities for the feeder module. For example, this allows for some structural printed add-ons that we can use to link boxes. There are of course a couple of things that still need to be done. Most of them are electronic and software based, but um, I think we should also connect a vacuum to it so that the chips don't get everywhere. To translate the commands coming from the computer to the motors of the CNC, I used this board here that I designed a few years ago for this purpose. Um, but now that the whole thing seems to run smoothly, I think I have to clean the wiring up a bit. Also, I think we should maybe reduce the density of the components just a tiny bit, because having all those heat sources together in an enclosure could create some real thermal problems. And speaking of cabinets, the CNC can actually mill more than just boxes, for example this control cabinet has, by coincidence, exactly the same measurements and fits perfectly onto the CNC. So we could create some very custom cable outlets for this. I do personally actually have more of a background in electrical engineering than in mechanical. And if this is interesting to you, we will include more electronic design topics in some of the next videos. I know that I haven't been able to address quite a few of your comments and questions yet. So I'm planning to do kind of a Q&A talk video where I explain my general idea for the MPS and the vague direction for this channel. So if you have any more questions, please comment. And speaking of the CNC, I did not want to put too much time into uh, developing a part that is not an element of the feeder right now. So I pushed through it pretty fast. It could very well be that I have overlooked something so if you have any feedback in general, please tell me in the comments. I really appreciate this. Also, I have uploaded all the design files for the fourth and fifth axis, um, so you can play around with it. And if someone wants to design an automatic clamping mechanism for the box, please go ahead. That would be really cool. As always, there's a lot of stuff left to do. So if you want to see me build those prototypes, then hit the subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.